Well, welcome back to another episode of the Soundworks Collection video series. I'm Michael Coleman, and this week I'm incredibly excited to have the sound team from Chloe Zhao's new film, Nomadland. Um, you might know Zoe from her previous film, Song My Brothers Taught Me, the writer. Both of those films are just incredible uh, achievements of storytelling and character development. But today we're going to be talking uh, about Nomadland, starring Frances McDormand. It's based on a, a book, a nonfiction book called no Nomadland Surviving America in the 21st century by writer Jessica Bruder. And I'm so happy to have my guest today. Zach, you were um, on this film, you were the re-recording mixer and supervising sound editor. And Sergio, you were the additional re-recording mixer and sound designer, supervising sound editor. Um, I remember uh, my first impression when I was watching this film, I was just like, I'm so interested to see how big or how nimble the sound team is. Because it feels like the, uh, the film in of itself, it feels so, it's so in the moment and so like a, a verite, like you are just there with Fern, with Francis McDormand's character and the work that you guys did. Um, it, it Loud is not always better. And in this case, I felt like you guys had the wonderful job to craft the world uh, where, where Fern travels. So did, did either of you guys, were you familiar with this story or of Chloe's uh, previous work? Um, what was your exposure to to any and all of this? Uh, honestly, this, this is my first time to work with Chloe, mm -hmm. and, and after my approach to the to the to the film, mm -hmm. uh, um, I'm just writing some some notes for the for the story, and I was falling in love uh, about the story and the and the way the the language from mm -hmm. Chloe Zaho in this in this particular film. So. Yeah, uh, I, I met Chloe because of my my manager Eileen Feldman mm -hmm. introduced me with her and we talk about uh, my my CV and all the stuff and mm -hmm. <laughs> and I and I, I I feel very very lucky guy to to have the opportunity to work with her. Awesome. What about for you, Zach? I had watched the writer when it came, shortly after it came out and was available to to watch and I remember being just completely blown away by the style of filmmaking in that film, which is pretty similar to uh, to what we were working with in Nomadland. And uh, it stuck with me and resonated for a, a long time. And then um, the opportunity came up. Um, I believe Sergio was, was sort of well into the design process by the time a conversation came up that that they that Chloe might need to have a mixer in Los Angeles to work with. And uh, she had had asked uh, for Sergio to speak with me, and we we got along great right from the start, and had you know pretty similar ideas of how we imagined the the film sounding, and um, trying to you know uh, help Chloe create her vision, and um, and so we pretty much got started right away from there. That's awesome. It's something it, I always love the um, the all the early pre production the the. You know, development period. It seems my my understanding. What I read is uh, in 2017, Francis and her producing partner Peter Spears, who also worked on Call Me by Your Name, they optioned the book, and then they had seen one of Chloe's films. I, I forget where specifically. Where, I think it was C. She saw the writer. the writer. The writer. Yeah, exactly. And then it was just like it was. You know, at that point. Well, I, I read the story that she that that Francis like she the film the writer finished, and she was like, you know. <laughs> who made this this yeah. is amazing and that just her and peter immediately connected the dots and then they all met each other at i think uh the spirit awards that year okay. and that because the writer francis mcdormand was there with uh three bull three billboards mm -hmm. um and so it was just sort of like they they all fit with each other perfectly yeah i think it's super interesting that um you know when people option books or they have um a very close relationship to material that they're precious and they're also patient sometimes you know with finding the right fit and i you know for you what what, what is it about uh this team's relationship to the material and and chloe and francis relationship to it that to you was evident you know when you guys started working on it yeah my 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 sensation was the 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 human being no as a human being is was my real connection and the the fragility meaning of of the word 
it's 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 in the the whole film so again uh, throughout the friend's journey so my my connection was really strong uh, with the story and as soon as i finished the the to watch the the film so i tried to to write my my own notes mm -hmm. to 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 have a an authentic sound design and soundscape for the film i want to contribute to the language of Cloyes uh, as a as a visionary storyteller, mm -hmm. so the treatment should be uh, very minimalistic mm -hmm. in some way, but at the same way it should be immersive, mm -hmm. with many gentle details around us and preserve this thin line between fiction and nonfiction, like a documentary, like a fiction, and and try to preserve and and bring the good sound sound elements to to contribute to the story in in every single sequence mm. that's okay. what treatment yeah yeah i mean uh, so did either of you have relationships with chloe in the past on, on i mean this is the first time collaborating with her right that's yeah. correct so you know what is it like meeting a director for the first time i mean she's I mean, you can go back and look at her previous work and kind of understand her storytelling style or how she likes to, you know, work with her cinematographer and, you know, you can get a sense of it. But I feel like this, uh, there's a lot of kind of exploration, um, both in the writing stages and like kind of what shows up on screen. And then obviously, you know, kind of maybe what you guys are representing, how much early pre-production discussions did you guys have and what were, you know, maybe some of those discussions were you guys focused on? Yeah, I I I I knew uh, Chloe uh, at at the middle of May or beginning of June, mm -hmm. I believe. And uh, my <clears throat> my approach to her was I, I saw previously writer and and I understand her her language. And then uh, I was uh, when I was I have a meeting with her and talk about the, the sound of Lomanland. And I realized that Chloe has a very strong idea what she wants to for the film. So she was very clear all the time, very specific, and, and, and was he, he gave us a, a very nice, a very good direction about the sound. So it helps a lot when the director knows what exactly wants for the for the for the film mm -hmm. and this is what's the, the case working with chloe and besides that she was very gentle all the time <laughs> that's awesome um for, for you zach did you find that um waiting i mean did you have much exposure to production i mean uh, you know how important is it for you even early on to kind of you know look at i mean is it better to look at final picture were you looking at early cuts like what to you is is helpful to kind of get an understanding of the tone and balance of everything i i would say that generally i i'm like all sound people i love to get involved as early as possible even you know if even before the film had been shot in this case the film was mostly edited the the picture editorial which chloe edited the film uh was moving at light Speed. And Sergio and his team were already well into the design by the time there there was a conversation about, uh, you know, how we were going to mix the film. And um, what I thought was really kind of amazing was Chloe, before even talking to me, said, why don't, you know, she just asked that I watch it and make sure, mm -hmm. first of all, that it was something that resonated with me, which, of course, it did and blew me away. And, and I had, as I mentioned, I had already seen the writers. I was super eager to see it. And the films feel... Um, they feel very much uh, of the same, you know, ilk, and um, and so getting then the opportunity to talk to her, which the first conversation I had with her wasn't more than ten minutes, maybe fifteen minutes. Um, I, I came to that conversation extremely prepared and and with a very you know clear sense of what I thought she was trying to say, and was very excited to talk about all of the ideas, but mostly just get her sense of what what it was that she wanted to do and make sure that I understood that and and I think the thing was was that she 
it's it's such a clear documentary style of filmmaking. It's a verite kind of filmmaking that um, that resonated with me mostly because I had done a lot of documentary work, which she was aware of. And I think that was something that she wanted me to contribute to it was to try to help um, always bring the sound back to a place of reality and, and truth and being authentic to uh, to the film. Yeah, so I mean, that, I mean that's a good, uh, good, um, good point to bring up, which is that, you know, Chloe not only is a filmmaker, but she's also an editor in the sense that she like she did her first edit. Um, it's my understanding. Um, do you guys feel that, you know, when you work with a director who is so sensitive to picture, how you know, what was your understanding of her sensibility of the sound work, the sound? What what things did she pick up on? What kind of tones? Because a lot of this film is really like atmospheric. It's listening, it's being alone, it's taking the perspective of Fern, whether it's in her van or walking around the community. You know, did you guys have opportunities to um uh, go out and and you know do any additional atmospheric records like what what were the kind of like the things that you needed to kind of fill in um, you know for that sound palette? Yeah, in, in my experience it was very unique because of the pandemic day. So uh, working with with Chloe during this period was very 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 different in, mm -hmm. in many ways. So. Uh, our, our first conversation, I take a lot of notes and I, and I start working with my editors and I do meetings and, and I try to exchange my ideas with them about the, the sound for the film because the treatment should be very minimalistic in many ways, but at the same time should be immersive. No matter if we are uh, working in like a, a documentary and fiction, but we try to put some details all the time in every sequence. We should focus on her, obviously, on her fragility. But at the same time, there's something happening around us of camera, and, and try to be authentic with the soundscape. Hmm. So when I did my own research about the American West, I discovered this uh, richness, a huge richness of sonic sound. So uh, I'm start <clears throat> choosing from my own recordings uh, library and and I, and I bring to to my desk and I start uh, exploring on that and following the the production sound because the hmm. production sound is amazing it's a really really good job so that was my my first guide and i mm -hmm. and i tried to preserve the authenticity and then bring more layers and layers and layers and try to live harmoniously in in every second sequence included the with the score music you know the ludovico's music the beautiful ludovico. yeah yeah, but I mentioned your production sound mixer, uh, Mike Wolf Snyder. You know, for a film like this, when you really are relying on a production sound mixer to capture the sound of those rooms, were you guys how, how much of production sound were you able to maintain and, and and keep throughout? Like, did you have to supplement much or? Yeah, no, it was about I would say ninety nine point nine percent production sound. <laughs> wow, there's maybe. Um, I I want to say there's a dozen uh, ADR lines in the film. Okay. Um, Mike is amazing. He he captured um, beautiful production sound, and he was also the boom operator. Oh, wow. Okay. Incredible. Okay. So double duty. Yeah. So knowing that uh, your production sound is, is going to be your base, you, what, what were the types of things that you're supplementing and adding in some additional color and flavor? Um, I, I love some uh, like some things that I'm thinking of too. Is like when she's in her van and like you just kind of hear the outside world, like just kind of like what's going on um people and movement and stuff but like what, what were some of the other things that you guys felt were necessary to kind of accent with yeah uh, in my mind oh i have three stages of the sound design mm -hmm. it should be prominent inside the pan and uh, all the time to just to put the audience on, on real perspective on, on her fragility and and the next stage is with serenity that we have a lot of layers of winds, different winds that embrace the the ferns journey, 
and and combine it with uh, harmoniously, uh, harmoniously with the with the score, and then uh, a lot of silence. No mm -hmm. silence. Like we did it in purpose. For example, in the Badlands. No, uh, uh, when we are when he, she gets lost in that big rocks, beautiful rocks, mm -hmm. and. and and we focus on, on her and her fragility at the same time. So in those three levels, we try to to preserve these kind of ideas and and preserve the authentic, authenticity in, in the yeah. in the in the process selecting the the right sounds. And then with a great job with with Zach mixing all the layers and all that stuff in in five one that's great um can you guys talk about dynamics when it comes to like a film that's pretty quiet how do you like to manage your dynamics when you're thinking about maintaining uh kind of like just it's not a noise floor it's just you know the sound the room tone really i guess i'd say um I, what have you guys found when it's kind of quiet consistently throughout but different rooms like what's what was your takeaway i mean i i, I think of also um Sergio of your work on Roma, which is, you know, kind of like an everyday life, you know, listening of your environment. But I guess from this film, you know, maybe Zach, what what can you say just about mixing dynamics when the dynamics are already so quiet? Well, I think uh, it starts with a really clean you know, production track, which I think uh, Mike was able to capture. And and then also Chloe filmed in, in locations that were really, really inherently quiet spaces with the exception of whatever environmental sounds were, you know, uh, inherent in those spaces. And, and those, those things we didn't treat as, uh, you know, problems or anomalies that we needed to try to scrub out or get rid of. We embraced those things. And, uh, and then Sergio, obviously, uh, with the design embraced and, and carefully designed sounds, uh, winds and, and things like that, that harmonized with uh, the qualities of the production sound. So, so much so that we were not, we were not, we were not needed to to uh, overly noise reduce or equalize or suppress those things out, and and our goal was really to to keep the performance intact and to keep the sound as organic as possible. And it's you know I was rewatching the film not too long ago and found that there's actually a fair amount of uh, signal noise present in the film <laughs> that I I personally really like. I think it, it's just sort of like part of the world and and contributes to that sort of verite open quality that that makes the film sound the way it does mm. yeah it's uh to me it's like you know i think habit no nah, i'm making an assumption but you know for sound folks doing editorial work and mixing we want to grab the eq we want to roll out the bottom we want to get rid of air you know high-end air but yet in this case it was the i think you guys made the right choice to preserve all that because that that it's uh it's more of a feeling right it's not necessarily uh, has to be accurate technically but um it's a feeling so um where did you guys end up mixing this and and, and you know when what, what was like the production site the production yeah timeline for your mix well, I think it's important to note that our mix uh, was happening while we were editing. Uh, we okay. were, you know, Sergio was editing and pre-dubbing his effects in his room. Um, I was editing and, and pre-dubbing uh, dialogue in my room. And ultimately, we we would uh, present 30 minute, 30 minute sections to Chloe that were basically, uh, you know, a, a temp mix. Uh, with with everything presented as holistically and as completed as uh, completed of an idea as we could come up with, and and then ultimately we you know would go through that throughout the film, and by the time we made it to the final mix, really the film was was in great shape, and and the time at the stage, which was at Disney Stage A in Burbank, hmm. uh, we were we were really just doing large sort of theatrical sitting back and watching long stretches of the film and making really big creative macro decisions, which is such a great place to be in, at, you know, at that point that the director is sitting on the stage and, and you sit back and you watch the first 30 minutes and it's like, wow, that's, that's pretty much what, what we were, what we're trying to do. Now we can think about it really more from the audience's point of view and think about what are the big things that, you know, not the, the granular, uh, that little knock, that little thing over there. It's more about you know how, do, how does it just generally feel, and um, so it's it 
it worked out great that way. For you guys, what do you appreciate about this style of, of storytelling, this type of filmmaking when it's a little, I'd say more observational and, you know, not relying on kind of these moments of, you know, kind of set pieces or whatnot. Um, it, it, I'd say, you know, it does feel more documentary than, than anything. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say the, these are, you know, the, the characters are beautiful people. They're human beings. And, and there's so much that, that I think all of us can, can identify with and so much that resonates about the characters that jumps off the screen and that you, you can identify with about their story. And, and so, um, Chloe has, uh, you know, had an idea of how she wanted to film it. I think uh, Francis and and Peter uh, Spears had an, you know, took the book and had an. Uh, there was there was an original idea, and they all were in sync with each other about how they were going to tell that story. And then from that point forward, it trickles down to the way all of the actors act, or the non-actors act, or how the cinematographer shoots the scenes, or how. Mike Will Snyder uh, puts the boom into the scene and how he captures the dialogue and and you know all of these things are are connected with each other and ultimately come to us in a form that just kind of speaks to itself and tells you what you need to do with it and it it just kind of uh, it's all about just maintaining the organic original idea that Chloe had. Mm, that's great. What about you, Sergio? Yeah, that's that's right. The, to to preserve the organic idea and. And continue to the to the to follow her idea. Uh, it's very important, or was very important for us to preserve that line. So uh, yeah, it was a challenging process because if it's like a documentary or fiction, we should uh, be aware of the fragility meaning of of of, of friends. Uh, I mean the, her persona, her character. So during the whole journey, to preserve that thin line was the big challenge because it's very easy to go to the very effective uh, or, or or too too um, documentary. So to preserve that line or, or do the sound design around the edge, mm -hmm. that was my main goal to preserve that line and and bring more ideas for mm. Chloe and for the film. That's great. Uh, how much interaction did you have with, you, uh, with I guess the music is by uh, uh, Ludico, Ludico Inadi, is that right? Ludico? Ludico. Yeah. Um, Ludovico Inadi. There you go, thank you. Yeah, um, how much interaction did you guys have um, with that and, and a sense of spotting or where cues were gonna be going and whatnot? Yeah, uh, uh, at the very beginning, I saw the film. The I know I don't remember the cut that I saw, but the film was uh, with the Ludovico's music and and the tempo and the rhythm with against the cut that uh, Chloe do. Uh, it was magic for me. So uh, I discovered that the it was very unique because the composer didn't. Uh, bring the music for the film mm -hmm. uh, was the other way around. The the film uh, Chloe bring that music uh, to the to the to the film, and in in and it was an extraordinary how the how Chloe put everything in balance and with that equilibrium was so beautiful. So for me it was a, a very very nice experience to work in in that process and bring and bring more uh, ideas in terms of, 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 of spaces, of sounds about the landscapes, because the, the music should be the hero mm -hmm. in, in those moments, in those uh, montage. So it's, it's beautiful that, that she, the way she, she do it. Mm. She do it. Yeah, so, and also I didn't ask you before, but how do you, um, the two of you split up? Who, who is handling? Dialing effects or music? How would you guys make? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I handle the the, the effects, mm -hmm. sound design, backgrounds, all that stuff, and sax, uh, dialogues, and music. What, what, so, what were the? Um, was he giving you stems for music, or uh, yeah, what what were the deliver deliverables for you, Zach? So uh, initially, she cut with stereo cues that I think that she pulled from iTunes or something like that. Yeah. Uh, 
but ultimately the cues that she chose stayed the same. Uh, mm -hmm. She worked with a really great music editor named Alex Levy, who I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's not, maybe it's Levy, but um, <laughs> Alex was given uh, Ludovico's stems after uh, she had cut with the with the mastered stereo cues. And the interesting thing was, was that the, the stems actually didn't quite exactly match the, the full stereo mixes. So Alex would go in and, and from an editorial point of view, uh, manipulate things so that they matched with each other. But that was one of the most fun parts of the mix was to, to get, you know, our fingers into Ludovico's music and then take the original idea of his, of his, of his cues and then really weave them into the film much more immersively. Um, and, and having the stems obviously made that much more possible. What, what about for you, Sergio? Um, I'm, uh, you, you, I think before we started recording, I asked, you know, what what's one of your favorite scenes? You mentioned this fern walking through the community in spring. What, you know, what is it about that scene? What is about that moment that, that you like? The, um, the, the, uh, I love the, the, this community and, and uh, the, the, as a human beings, we are so fragilities and, and especially during this period and, and, and when I saw the film, for me, it was a very moving moment. So uh, I have um, a, lot of, a lot of sensitive, and I understand the, the Chloe's sensitivity for, for her feeling to, to tell the story in, in, in many ways. So I, I love to, to preserve this uh, idea and contribute with my ideas for the for the soundscape and 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 bring more more authenticity in, in this in this department. So I don't know if this responds my your question. But... <laughs> That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, I think the environment on the the mixing stage can be one a, a very collaborative. Sometimes you, you know you guys will have a first pass and then kind of responsive. What, what was what was kind of the dance that you guys, the order, I guess, that you guys went about it? Did, did she give you initial direction or did she kind of just present you with everything and then you guys went for it? Yeah, well, how, how, did, how did it um, present itself? At the very beginning, uh, we started the conversation and she gave me a, a map mm -hmm. for the, the, all the, the journey, the first journey. And, and she was very specific with every single- A literal map. roadmap. Exactly. Oh, really? Okay. So you fought the physical map following it? Okay. Yeah. And, and I follow the, her, her instructions and, and I put my, my feeling in, in, in an old sequence and we start working two minutes or three minutes of film every day mm -hmm. just to have uh, until 30 minutes after two weeks, and then present to, to Chloe. I, I sent to Zach all my pre dops in 7 1, and then Zach put uh, his dialogue and the music, and do everything in context in, with a mix down in stereo for Chloe. And then we start uh, working from, from that point. In, in real time, I mean, we used uh, these great tools called uh, Evercast, working at the same time, spotting the, the, the film, and have the feedback immediately from, from Chloe, Zach, and I. That's awesome. What about for you, Zach? You know, from your experiences of working, like, you know, working on documentary films is a very different type of uh, process. It's, you know, it's a very fluid, ever flowing, trying to figure out the story very much so more in, in the edit. But um, yeah, what, what do you, what does you appreciate just about Chloe's direction of actually presenting you with a physical map? I mean, I don't, I, given the fact that we were making this in times of COVID, um, you know, and weren't able to be with each other, it, it's true. Evercast is an amazing tool. Um, I mm -hmm. think, though, that if Chloe hadn't been so sensitive and patient and flexible um, and so clear with her direction, it would have been really difficult to get to to the the final mix that we ultimately have. Um, but I do I, I think um, there was something 
you know, about that process that just kind of evolved. And, and then ultimately, once we made it to the stage, we had something that we all knew was was in the right zone. But you're right, being able to work with each other in person, that's just not, you can't replace that. And being able to sit in a room and feel the energy of the mix in a, in a beautiful, you know, theatrical space, it, it really, um, it has its own um, influence in the process that that ultimately I'm, I'm very glad that we were able to do that. And also, I'm thinking of the case of, uh, you know, watching this film with an audience, which is like one of the kind of the things we anticipate of being able to be in a room with people. And it's so funny how, you know, we are, we react so differently when there's other people outside of the creative circle, you know, an audience who's coming in there with no understand or, you know, precondition to understand like what, what the story is going to be. So not as, I mean, I guess there was, you know, a festival, you know, screening for this, but, um, yeah, well, well, what's your sense of kind of that this is, I mean, the film will come out, it's going to be, it's going to be out here in the future and it's going to be hopefully ideally in a theater, but you know, people's experience of, for you guys watching it with an audience, what, what was it kind of like working within that vacuum of this, in this time of, with COVID and everything else of not really having like a test screening type of family or friends type of, you know, reactions or feedback. Yeah, it's very important to to that question because the <clears throat> you have another perspective when you watch the film with with audience, and but specifically during these pandemic days is really complicated. So, so what uh, I I I would love to 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 watch it with 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 audience, but <clears throat> honestly, I don't know if that happens. <laughs> yeah. Is but uh, for my colleagues and my professionals, uh, the way that if if they have the opportunity to watch the film in, in a theater or in the room, small room with with surround speakers, you will love it because we we, we did a great job uh, with the spatialization in this film. Yeah, so uh, I love to understand that. How, how do you guys like to use your surrounds, and even, especially in a film like this? How how active are you panning stuff off um, when it comes to the environment? Like you know, even in a film like this, where dynamically it is much quieter. Yeah, how, how do you like to treat uh, to use your your surrounds? Uh, well, I think I think uh, it's a, a careful balance between immersive cinema and a, creating a theatrical experience. Uh, and also being um, cognizant of wanting to, to somewhat emulate a, a documentary or verite kind of quality. So wanting to always anchor things to the screen, but also embracing the fact that we have this amazing format that we can work in and, and really bring out the sound off of the screen and make it a much more immersive experience. And so uh, often we would let, um, you know, interior scenes would tend to be a little bit more spatially up front exterior scenes we would allow the wind and the the insects and cicadas and all of those mm -hmm. textures to be a little more immersive um but the the surround was rarely ever used as just sort of a general bed it was almost a very specific almost always a very specific discrete set of decisions going on, um, largely with Sergio in terms of the choices of what kinds of sounds, what textures, and he would often place very specific sounds in the surround field um, and design it specifically for that purpose. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, once we got into the final mix and feeling it in the theater environment, we would make decisions about how that was translating in that, in that situation. And, uh, Ludovico's music was was particularly fun to uh, really bring out um, because again we had stems so we were able to play with how those felt in the room and and expand on uh, the sonic you know feeling of those songs. Uh, what about you, Sergio? Yeah, no, that that's that's yeah, that, that's that's totally right. Uh, the the specialization in this uh, film, uh, we choose different. Uh, specific uh, sounds for uh, uh, for backgrounds and to be honest we didn't push uh, much elements because we we try to preserve this treatment between this 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 line no fiction non-fiction and we try to preserve that and be authentic with the with the film and don't abuse 
to this technology. So we try to be embrace the scenes in every sequence and preserve, preserve this kind of serenity all the time. Mm. With everything in equilibrium and, 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 a, and a good balance mm. uh, during the whole journey. It's uh, just thinking if about- If I can also, you know, at the risk of being somewhat technical also, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the, the other um, thing that personally for me as a mixer, um, when I started mixing, um, I tended to, to use correlated sounds much more aggressively in the surround environment. And over the years, I've come to really appreciate how decorrelating sounds and how having specific discrete sounds coming out of what it's 7.1 or Atmos, um, just being highly specific and not sharing sounds across screen channels. Um, really has a way of of creating immersion without drawing too much attention to itself. And also with a film like this, where you're dealing with a limited schedule, uh, we were really moving very quickly. I, I've also found that doing that uh, helps with, you know, near field mixing and down mixing. And, and so that was one thing that was sort of a pleasant surprise was with Sergio's decisions, with the discrete textures that he chose, and then how we approached the mix. The near field mix came together really, really quickly as well, and it, it, it down mix very nicely. And ultimately, that's how a lot of people are going to see and hear the film. Yeah, I'm thinking about just you know how, now, obviously with, with the uncertainty of, of of the future here, obviously of how people are going to be presented with the films. You know, for me, when I got a screener, I usually like if I can, I'll watch it in stereo, like in my studio here on studio monitors and whatnot. In this case, I watch it with headphones with with Nomad Lens. But that it, the Please. intimacy of of what you guys are talking about to me really translated well. Um, it it was Thank you. something, yeah, it, it was something that I wasn't expecting um, because I, it's so funny. I've been to a lot of those places before. Um, so I kind of remember the eeriness and the very isolating, isolating and also the sense of, you know, like there are other people here, but they're kind of like over there. They're not really here. Everyone's kind of, it's like when you go camping, you kind of hear like the campground next to you, but you know, there's also like, an active environment around you. Um, so, you know, I, I think like just, I think for people who haven't physically been to these spots, there was a sense of aloneness that I think was really well captured. And obviously Chloe, you know, with her own understanding of the material and these locations and traveling there and all the work that she did when, when putting the story together, I felt like um, it was represented really well. Um, you know, maybe lastly, I would love to ask you guys, is there something now that the, film is done and you had a little time away from it what's your perspective and a takeaway um from working on this project that that you have um maybe you know uh, a nugget of knowledge yeah for for my experience working in this in this film it's it's a it's a huge it's it's a huge experience because at the same time um i <clears throat> i'm trying to preserve all the time with uh, every single director, the, the original idea for the sound. But in this scenario, uh, the everything uh, in terms of sound, Chloe was very aware on that because she wants to start working with the sound with Mike on the set. <laughs> regarding wild tracks and everything. So I realized that that Chloe, she knows exactly what she wants. And then continue with the conversation with us during the post-production process. So what I love with in that process is, is that. So for me, the sound design at the final mix always goes hand in hand with the original idea. And if you stay true to it, it will tell you exactly everything you want to convey. So that's what I, that's we and 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 I and I confirm, I did a great a great partner with 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 Zach and, and with his amazing talent, and we did a great job. Absolutely, I, I I'm I'm so proud of, of the work what that we did. That's awesome. What about for you, Zach? I mean, I was certainly thrilled to have the opportunity to work on a film that is clearly, I mean, even watching the, the you know, the cut, the very first cut, the first time I, I was blown away by it and, and really moved by it. 
Um, but I think also for me, I'm, um, I'm at a point in my life to where I just like working with people that I like working with and that are, mm -hmm. you know, good people and, and are supportive. And, you know, uh, I cannot tell you a single filmmaker that I've ever worked with. I mean, I've, uh, that has the level of positivity and optimism and support that Chloe brought to every aspect of the process. And, uh, I really hope I have a chance to work with her again someday because mm -hmm. she's she's a really, really special person. And I think she brought the, the best out of Sergio and myself. And, um, you know, it was a great, it was just one of those great things where it's a good film and, and it's good people too. That's awesome. That's, that's the right combination that, you know, when it comes together that everyone can feel like they're doing, they're doing their best work. And uh, I think it all shows up on the screen in, in, you know, subtle ways that make a big difference. It's a small, it's not about always the, the big, the big and loud moments, but it's the subtle kind of decisions that people, like I said, you feel um, uh, as much as you hear. So um, yeah, Sergio, Zach, thank you guys both so much for sharing a little time. Talk about No My Land. I'm excited for people to check it out. Thank you guys so much for uh, talking today. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. Conversation. <laughs>